Welcome to everyone and welcome to Porous Media Tea Time Talks. My name is Javier and I'll be your host today. Also accompanying me, we have Nara Brandao from the Universidad Federal de Uerlandia and Professor Maya Rocker from Indoven University of Technology. For the one joining us for the first time, Porous Media Tea Time Talks is a forum that we have been using during these past months to give young researchers the chance to present their work to the broad scientific community around the world. We are pleased to see our subscriber count growing. So please, if you like these videos, feel free to share them and engage with us and the speakers in the comment section. If you have any questions or comments that you would like the speakers to answer live, please type them in the chat window to the right of the, of the video, and we will ask them at the end of each talk. Today, our first speaker is Oliver Pauling, a PhD student from, from the Poor Mechanics Lab of the University of Oxford. His main, inter, his main research interests are deformable porous materials and multiphase flow. Today, we'll be talking about his most current research in gas liquid separation in soft porous media. Without further ado, Oliver, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Javier. Um, and thank you to the, the rest of the team for the invitation to give this talk. Um, so yeah, I'm Oliver and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. And my talk today is about gas liquid phase separation in a soft porous medium. This is work that I've done with my PhD supervisor, Chris McMinn, in collaboration with Liam Morrow, a postdoc in our group, and Matt Hennessy, who's a research fellow in the Math Institute here in Oxford. So the main motivation for this work is to do with the venting of greenhouse gases such as methane from underwater seabed sediments like the one you can see in this video here. These sediments are typically modelled as being soft porous materials and what's going on here is microbes living within the pore space of the sediment uh, produce small amounts of methane gas as the decomposed organic matter. This methane gas that is produced forms small bubbles which coalesce together and grow and they'll then rise upwards through the sediment until they reach the, eventually they reach the top of the sediment, at which point they're released into the overlying water. One of the reasons why this is an interesting system to study is that the rate of gas venting from the sediment depends strongly on the dominant, dominant gas migration mechanism within it. And I'll talk uh, briefly about what these different migration mechanisms are on the next slide. The poor scale physics that controls these different migration mechanisms is relatively well understood. But the focus of uh, this project has been to develop a continuum model which describes the behavior that we see. So we can reproduce the, the, the behavior that we see in nature experimentally um, by considering a quasi 2D flow cell, such as the one you can see on the right here, which we fill with a close packing of squishy hydrogel beads and then saturate it with a liquid. What we then do is we introduce, uh, inject a small amount of non-wetting gas into the base of the flow cell and see what happens. So what you see is that when the gas is injected, it forms an open cavity within the solid packing, which then rises upwards through the flow cell. What we then do is that we increase the confinement on the packing through the use of this permeable piston at the top here. What we see is that as the piston is applied and the confinement increases, firstly the bubble is trapped, it stops rising, and then as the confinement increases further, the gas starts to leak into the pore space before eventually the cavity ruptures, at which point all the gas is forced into the pore space and then it just leaks out the top of the flow cell. So what you can see in this, in this video is that um, so these soft porous materials support these two distinct gas and migration mechanisms. Either gap the gas can form open cavities within the solid packing by displacing the solid grains, like you can see here, or it can migrate through the pore scale base itself by displacing pore liquid. In order to form these open cavities, the rest of the solid grains have to be compressed into a smaller volume, which means that this cavity formation can only occur if the solid skeleton is soft enough to support these large deformations. Whether or not the gas will migrate as, through, as an open cavity or through the pore space, effectively comes down to a composition between elastic forces due to the solid skeleton um, resisting compression and capillary forces due to it being thermodynamically um, unfavorable for the, the non wetting gas phase to enter the narrow pore throats between the solid grain. So we conceptualize this form the formation of these gas cavities and this transition between gas in an open cavity and gas within the pore space as a process of thermodynamic phase separation, which we describe by a phase field model. And I'll give a brief outline of the model here. So essentially, we consider the system as being a three phase mixture consisting of gas, liquid, and solid. We model the gas and liquid phases as being viscous incompressible fluids, with the gas being the non wetting fluid and the liquid being the wetting fluid. For the solid phase, we also assume that that's locally incompressible, 
and this is linearly elastic when in compression. When it's in tension, however, because we're considering um, non-cohesive granular materials, we assume there's, there's no resistance to this. We quantify the presence of these different um, phases through the use of the relative volume fraction, um, so I'm going to connect phi, and these three volume fractions, the so gas, liquid, and solid, all just sum up to one. In order to formulate balance laws between these different uh, volume fractions, we start by considering conservation of mass, so, uh, which you can see here. It's because of the incompressibility assumption we've made, the density just cancels out of this equation. Um, and we're also going to make the assumption that the gas and the liquid are immiscible. So the gas can't dissolve into the liquid or exsolve out of it, which just means that there are no sources, sources or sink terms in this equation. We also consider conservation of momentum. Um, and the assumptions that go that we put in here are, are that there are no body forces on the system, so we're not going to consider the effect of gravity, for example, and that we can decompose our stress tensor to three different um, three different terms: one due to the fluid pressure P, one for the elastic stress sigma prime, and one for the quarterback stress K, which just arises from internal interfaces that form within the system. For our constitutive relationships, um, we're going to assume a Darcy-like forcing. So the relative liquid flux on the left here is just proportional to gradients in the pressure. Again, there are two contributions to the pressure here, one from the fluid pressure P um, that I mentioned on the previous slide, and one due to the capillary potential psi, which we can find by taking um, variation derivatives of the energy that I'll talk about in a moment. A final assumption we make for our model here is that the, solid, the, the packing is isotropic and has a constant solubility. That just means that we have a simple linear prefactor in front of our gradient term here. Finally, we to complete our model, we need to specify a free energy for our system. This is what determines the specific form of the capillary potential and the quarter of stress that I mentioned before. So we assume that our free energy um, is just an additive function of the energy of all the different uh, energetic processes that are going on in the system. So we have um, an interaction energy, which is due to the interactions of all the different phases with each other. So the interaction with, of the liquid with the gas and the gas with the solid, for example. And this just depends on the relative volume fractions of each phase. We also have an elastic energy, um, which just depends on the strain of the solid skeleton, and an interfacial energy, which depends on gradients in the volume fractions. Um, by specifying this free energy, we co complete the system and have a complete system of equations, um, which we can just solve numerically. We, for simplicity, we're going to start by just thinking about this in a 1D system um, with periodic boundary conditions to, to see, what, see what happens. Before I dive straight into the, the full three phase um, simulations from our model, I'll start by considering a couple of two phase simplifications just to help us get a bit of intuition for, for what's going on here. So to start with, we'll consider the case where there's no solid um, in the system. So we've just got gas and liquid in, a, in an unconstrained domain. So we'll start our simulation with an um, almost homogeneous mixture of gas and liquid. And what we see is that the gas and liquid uh, separate into these distinct gas rich and liquid rich uh, domains, which of course, and over time, this is the behavior we expect to see. Um, it's typically described by a kahn hilliard type equation. Um, and yeah, it's just a phase separation in an in a unconstrained medium. We also consider a second, a second simplification, which is the case where there's no gas in our model. Um, so here we've just got solid and liquid. So this essentially corresponds to single phase um, fluid flow through a deformable porous medium. We can initialize our, um, our system here with an open cavity in the packing. And because there's no uh, there are no capillary forces and no background flow in this in this simplification, we will just see that um, as we run the simulation, the the open cavity will just close with solid front, the front solid grains moving in, and then the solid skeleton will just relax back to its underformed state. For the three phase simulations, we essentially have a, co a combination of these two effects. So I'm going to initialize um, these simulations with an underformed porous. Um, that's the solid skeleton here, which is noted by this blue line. And then within the pore space of the solid skeleton, um, we're going to have, again, a sort of almost homogeneous gas distribution. Um, and the, the amount of gas we've got in the system is just going to be quantified by this parameter that I'm going to call S0, which is just the initial gas saturation. And then gonna, I'm going to run the simulations in a second um, for two different cases, one for a stiff porous material, one for a soft porous material, so we can compare, compare what happens in the two cases. The, the, sort of the softness or deformability of the porous medium, I'm just going to quantify by a dimensionless parameter that I call beta. I'm talk about that more on the next slide, I think. So beta, beta is small for the stiff porous material and large for the soft porous material. So what we see when we run the simulations is that in the stiff case, essentially the elastic forces are too strong to allow these cavities to form. 
and the gas just all remains within the pore space. Conversely, for the soft porous material on the right over here, we see that the gas is able to open up these macroscopic cavities within the solid packet. And you have these distinct uh, domains where uh, it's basically all gas and there's no solid present. So essentially, these simulations um, sort of show, uh, show the behavior that we'd expect um, intuitively. Um, and the, the deformability of the solid skeleton uh, controls the onset of the phase separation process and whether or not these cavities are able to form. In order to work out or to think about which um, parameters uh, control this phase separation process more quantitatively, uh, in addition to our simulations, we also conducted a linear stability analysis of our model. And so we can produce this phase plane here, which shows the uh, stable and unstable regions in parameter space um, for various different values of the softness and the gas saturation. So in this top right region up here, this is the unstable region of our system. Um, and this is where we'll get the formation of the, the open cavities. And this bottom region down here is the stable region where the gas will just remain within the pore space. So what you can see is if we were to have a system with a certain amount of gas in it, say a gas saturation of 0.7, and we consider a stiff porous material, initially we'll be over here um, in, our, in our phase plane and we'll be in the stable region. So the gas will just remain within the pore space. If we were then to make the material softer and softer and softer, Eventually, we'll pass some critical value, at which point we'll pass into the unstable region of the phase plane, and then we'll have the spontaneous formation of these open cavities. As well as the softness and the gas saturation, we can also think about um, how the strength of the gas solid interaction affects, affects this process. I'm, just, uh, I'm going to um, quantify this gas solid interaction by a parameter that I'm going to call chi. And this is essentially the energetic cost of gas and solid being in contact with each other. And this depends on things like the grain size of the parts of solid grains and the wetting characteristics of the two fluids. So what you see is that as chi increases, which for example corresponds to the grain size decreasing, um, the, area, the, the area of instability in our phase plane increases in size. This is what we would uh, expect naively, because as chi increases, um, we're essentially, it essentially means that it's more energetically costly for the gas to remain within the pore space. So we're more likely to form um, these open cavities in which the gas and solid exists mostly in separate domains. So what you can kind of see from this is that, um, yeah, this, the softness and gas solid interaction um, parameters have a, have a strong effect on whether or not um, the phase separation process happens and what the dominant migration mechanism of our sediment will be. And with that, I think I'll conclude by picking up my summary slides and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver, for the very nice presentation. The, it's, it's now open for questions. You can post your questions by typing into the YouTube channel. Um, we have a bit of a delay for our transmission, so, so we may need to wait a bit for your questions to, to arrive at our site. In the meantime, I would like actually to ask a few questions to you, Oliver. Okay. Um, the first one being, you, you mentioned that the grain size measures. Does the grain shape uh, matter as well? Um, I don't think that's a sort of, sort of leading order effect. So, um, yeah, probably if you really uh, wanted the details of what's going on, it probably has some, some effect. I think it's a leading order. It's mostly just the, um, the grain size uh, and well, the gap between the different grains that determines um, the strength of this interaction. It's effectively the, the capillary entry pressure. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it probably has some small effect, but not, um, not major. Okay. And what about the distribution? So if you have multiple grain sizes? Um, yeah, that's a, again, this isn't yeah, something I've particularly considered, I guess. Um, the, I, yeah, I can see that that would, I don't really see, I can't sort of intuitively say how I think it would change it. I think it would change that um, parameter chi that I had. So the strength of the gas solid interaction. Um, I'm not sure if it would necessarily, I make it be large or smaller, but I think it's probably too, one of the two, um, which you can then see how that would yeah, affect, affect what um, the migration mechanism is going to be. Thanks. Um, you also mentioned uh, that some of the assumptions are incompre incompressibility. Now, this is for gas, of course, quite an assumption. Yeah. How complicated is it to include, include compressibility? Do you, do you plan to look into that? Um, yes, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, yeah, obviously, assuming gas is incompressible is never, you know, the most realistic situation. Yeah, it's certainly something we want to look at. Um, so, for simplicity, we've just started with it being an incompressible phase, um, just to make our life easier. I think it shouldn't be too hard. So, 
um, we'd, yeah, we'd have to come up with, uh, use some sort of uh, relation for the like, pressure law or whatever. But um, I don't think it should affect most of the energetics in the system, just sort of whether or not the gas is compressing. Um, so hopefully it won't be too hard to, to work in. OK. I see a question from the audience from Grigory Chapiro. Nice talk. Congratulations. How challenging is it to include gravity in 1D? Um, yes, that's a, a good question as well. So obviously I neglected gravity in the simulations. Um, we just got sort of going for simplicity in the first case. Um, I, I think well, the main place where gravity will come in will be in, the, um, in my momentum balance. I have a gravitational term. I don't think, again, I don't think it'd be too challenging, um, although uh, I've kind of assumed that there were all the phases are index matched here, so it wouldn't really do anything in this situation. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's, again, something we want to look at going forwards, um, which hopefully we can put in. Thanks. Oliver, I have a, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the computational complexity of these simulations and, and the challenges to upscale them to uh, 3D domains? Um, so yeah, so in terms of the computations, essentially we're just solving, um, in the 1D case, just two, two evolution equations, two parabolic PDEs. Um, so we're just doing it in, in MATLAB using finite differences for the sort of spatial derivatives. So it's not um, too tricky. I think going to 2D certainly doesn't want to kind of do as the next step. Um, I'm not sure about 3D, I guess. The model itself is derived in full 3D, so it shouldn't be uh, too challenging on that front. Um, the sort of computational side of that isn't something I've particularly thought about yet. Um, but yeah, I, I think yeah, I think it, sh it should be doable, but it's um, yeah, obviously trickier than what we're trying to do at the moment. You also pointed out that you want to work on partial miscible fluids. Yeah. What, what expects exactly did you have in mind? So the solution in for the gas into the, the, the water or something else? Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So I guess yeah, in nature, in all these physical systems, that's what's happening more easily. The gas can dissolve; um, it comes out of a solution. So that's something yeah we really want to look at going forwards. Um, essentially, yeah, for the gas to be able to def just like dissolve into the liquid, and we think we'd get some interesting behaviour there because if the gas can dissolve into the into the liquid. Um, say yeah, the methane just gets dissolved. Then it should be able to diffuse through the liquid in the pore space, and then perhaps uh, towards where the other cavities are, uh, and you get some sort of writing effect going on. That's what we envisage. So that's so yeah, something we really want to look at um, in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Oliver, for the nice presentation mm -hmm. and discussion. Um, I don't see any further questions, so I would suggest we move ahead to Tiago. Um, Tiago is a postdoc researcher at the Federal University of Jus de Fora. He applies numerical methods to simulate fluid flow and porous media with emphasis on foam displacement. Tiago got selected for the porous media tea time talks by the Brazilian Interpol chapter in the frame of the Brazilian Interpol chapter special. So thank you very much for coming here and the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to share with you some results on the, the simulation of foam displacement in, in porous media. Um, this is a joint work with uh, Felipe de Paula, Yuri Igreja, and Grigo de Shapiro. So I'd like to start with our application, which is the injection of phone for enhanced oil, re oil recovery. Uh, many of you may already know that the injection of gas, either in a single slug or in an alternated uh, fashion with uh, water, has been used for decades as an oil recovery process. However, the heterogeneity of the reservoir and the differences between the fluid mob mobilities can lead to uh, fingering, gravity segregation, and early gas breakthrough, which will uh, result in poor sweep efficiency. So the idea of the injection of phone is that it would increase the apparent viscosity of the gas phase and thus reduce its mobility, which would alleviate these issues. So just to illustrate, when we consider the injection of gas, which I show here in orange, into a porous medium filled with water here in blue, 
we expect some fingers to form here. What we want to achieve with full injection is a more regular flow front, like this, this second figure here. So in a classical two-phase flow model with uh, water and gas phases, uh, the mobility of these phases are given by these expressions here. So KRW and KRG are the relative permeabilities to water and gas, and mu W and mu G are the viscosities of the uh, water and gas phases. When we consider foam, instead of, uh, uh, of injecting uh, gas, uh, we will replace the uh, viscosity of the gas phase by the viscosity with four, uh, by the viscosity of foam. So, uh, following Hirasaki and Lawson, the foam viscosity, which we represent as mu f, will depend on foam texture, this n f, and gas velocity, this v g. So the foam texture, this n f. It's also known as foam density or bubble density. And it's a variable in this model. And, and it can be defined as the number of bubbles per unit volume. And here uh, we can see that the foam viscosity depends on its velocity. So we expect a non-Newtonian behavior in this flow. In this work, we used the stochastic bubble population model that was presented by Sinju and Zita to describe the dynamics of foam creation and destruction in the porous medium. Now let me talk ab about the mathematical model and its numerical approximation. So our main contribution here is the development of a foam displacement simulator, which we call a uh, fossil. And this simulator uses a staggered approach to find an approximate solution for the foam displacement model. Using this uh, staggered approach, we can solve the, the foam displacement model uh, by splitting it into two different models that are solved at the appropriate time scales. So the hydrodynamics, we have here the hydrodynamics problem and the foam dynamics problem. In the hydrodynamics problem, we want to find an approximation for the velocity and the pressure of the, the fluids. This problem comes from the conservation of mass of the fluid phases and from constitutive equations like the Darcy's law and compressibility relations. This system is solved in a coarser time scale using a mixed and hybrid finite element formulation, which is locally conservative and naturally stable. So, um, in the foam dynamics problem, we want to find an approximation for the saturation of the phases and for this ND here. ND is a non-dimensional foam texture. This problem comes from the uh, mass conservation of the phases and from a uh, bubble population balance equation here. Here, uh, Kg and Kd are the rates of uh, generation and destruction of bubbles in the model. The full dynamics model is solved in a finer time scale using a locally conservative finite volume formulation. This formulation provides us with uh, non-oscillatory solutions with reduced numerical dissipation. Now let me show you some uh, numerical results. We start using the permeability field of layer one of the SPE 10 benchmark, which I show in this, in this figure. And uh, the initial conditions are uh, the, the porous medium is filled with water. And we are going to inject a mixture of water and gas uh, through the uh, left part, the left, bo uh, left uh, border of the domain while the top and bottom border are closed to, to fluid displacement and the right border is open. So um, here I show two water saturation profiles. In the top, we are simulating, simulating the injection of just uh, water and gas. 
So uh, there is no uh, phone in this first case. In the bottom, we consider that there is plenty of surfactant in the water phase to form phone. So as phone has a lower mobility than gas, it uh, can improve the sweep efficiency in this second case. We can see that then that when uh, phone is created, the gas front is more regular than in the first case, and the gas breakthrough also occurs later than in the, the first case. And also, a much lower water saturation is observed inside the domain when phone is present. For a second example, we use the layer 36 of the SP, SP10 benchmark. And this layer shows a clear preferential path here. The initial and boundary conditions here are the same as, as before. So again, we can see that the gas front in the case with phone is much more regular than in the, in the case without phone. Uh, and the gas breakthrough occurs later. And although some uh, fluid st still takes this preferential path, we can see that the sweep efficiency was greatly improved by the usage of phone here, comparing with no phone case. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. And I would also like to acknowledge the support from Shell, ANP, UFJF, and LAMAP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, please type your questions into the YouTube channel if you have any. Thank you very much for the presentation. I wondered if you if you considered what, what you considered um, as as boundary conditions for your simulation. So in terms of the gas, was it incompressible? Was it emissible? Uh, in terms of so, so did you have did did the gas diffuse in your model? Did you consider that the gas diffuses into the liquid, or, or not so much? No, no. In this case, we consider that uh, gases and and liquids do not mix, so we're not considered uh, diffusion of gas in in liquid. The um, boundary conditions is just no flow in top and bottom, and a fixed rate injection of a mixture of an. Um, 90.9% uh, of gas and the rest uh, water in, in this uh, border. And in the right border, we uh, use a, a constant pressure and let the fluids flow through it. Okay, so um, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Thanks, Tiago, for your presentation. And um, please, what's the composition of the foam? And when you say no Newtonian behavior, are you considering shear thinning behavior? Yes, yes. In this case, uh, this model gives us a shear thinning behavior because of the exponent of the uh, velocity. In the let me go back here. Mm -hmm. Here. So we have this one third exponent here. So okay. it would be a shear thinning behavior. Ah, okay. So by the composition of phone, I don't, I'm not sure if I understand what you what you mean by that. Do you mean the surfactant or? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. So in this case, we're not modeling the, the surfactant. So mm. it's a, a reduced model. It's a, a simpler model. Okay. We already have this, um, this phase, uh, mm -hmm. no, not this phase, this component implemented mm -hmm. in, in Fossil. Oh. And we are starting to test some uh, different surfactants. So in this case, we we have the phone creation and destruction given by the source terms in this equation here. So these mm -hmm. parameters are uh, fitted by uh, experimental uh, laboratory results, right? Okay. Uh -huh. And it's it's not representing the surfactant per se. Okay. 
Okay, thanks. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, have, I have a question for you. Can you talk a little bit about the assumptions in uh, the wettability model and the relative permeability uh, functional relationship that you used? Okay, so I I have the expressions for the relative permeabilities. We use these parameters here. Uh, they are the relative permeabilities that were fitted by Sinju and Zeta in, in their work. So here the water is the, the, the wetting phase. And uh, well, I don't know what can I say more about this, if you have a... Um, I, I was just curious uh, on what model did you use? This is, this is good, thank you. Okay, thank you. We have two questions from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. The first one by Hosseini Nassab. Thank you for your talk. Results shown in slide six. How do you make sure they are correct? Okay. Slide six. Oh, this one, I guess. Um, so, okay. There are some people in our uh, group that are able to find analytical solutions for some uh, simpler cases. So it's not, uh, how can I say, I cannot be sure that these results are correct, but uh, we use these analytical solutions for simpler cases to validate the code that we write in Fossil. And um, well, although I know that these uh, parameters were fitted for a different kind of rock and a different kind of fluid in laboratory, um, we expect to see uh, similar behavior when we change the, the, porous, the porous material. But basically it's because we validated uh, our code with simpler uh, in simpler cases. There is another question, which I think is quite related to it. Is there any validation to experimental data? Or is there any plan for, 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 for validation with experimental data? So the question was posed by Hani Jake Sleiman. Okay, yes, not for uh, these results that I'm showing today, but uh, besides the validation using uh, analytical solution, we also uh, checked with some other results also from the, the same group, from the group of Professor Zita. Uh, and we could reproduce the behavior of phone in lab scale. So uh, yes, that's up to some point the, the code is validated against uh, experimental data. But of course, uh, there is uh, such difficulties in uh, obtaining data for uh, complex cases uh, in, in the laboratory. And uh, we could not validate all parts of, of the, the simulator yet. We're still working on that. I, I remember from, from experiments that an issue often with surfactants is that you, lo that you lose them in the experiment, that they get attached to the surface of the, of the solid instead yeah. of remaining in the foam. Is this something you can incorporate in your model or? Yes, yes. Uh, we just implemented adsorption models into the, into the simulator. It's able to, to reproduce this, this behavior, yes. There is one more question by Hossein Ninasab. I think you mentioned finite volume method was used. Can you elaborate why not finite difference? Oh, okay. Yes, the volume, finite volume method was used for the hyperbolic part of the, the problem. And it's basically uh, because we, we wanted to uh, use a, a flexible framework for uh, locally conservative um, uh, 
uh, numerical method. And well, I believe that uh, we, they are exchangeable, right? We, we can rewrite a finite volume formulation in the form of a finite difference formulation. And it's, it was just uh, the way we uh, would like to implement this, this numerical method. Okay, there are no further questions. If there is no further question uh, here in the studio, then I think we can we can close the session. So Tiago, thank you again for the for the great presentation and the great discussion. Thank you. And with this, um, yeah, I would like to thank the audience, of course, as well for listening and participating. And um, can you show the next exactly our next. Um, our next Post Media Tea Time Talks is at the 6th of April, 2021, in the morning. Um, it's with Tuantu Nguyen and Cynthia Michalkowski. So I'm looking very much forward to see you again in two weeks' time. Yeah, thank you again on behalf of the whole Post Media Tea Time Talks team. And if you have any questions, please just email us. Um, we are looking always forward to your feedback and comments.